One of the most powerful and most effective ways of learning how to write a first class essay at an undergraduate university level is by actually looking at examples of those that have previously written one and have achieved the level that you're after. And you can find these essays on university websites. It's not difficult to find at all, or you can even ask your course organizers for examples of essays that have achieved a first class because you can actually see what it looks like in real life to write at that level. It's one thing to have a mark scheme and to know what the requirements are and it's another thing to actually see what that looks like in action. So in today's video I'm going to be going through a first class essay from Oxford University so it's the best of the best and I'm going to be pointing out five different characteristics of this first class essay which have led it to achieve a uh, 70% plus which is first class in the UK so let's get straight into it so for this example I'm not going to be focusing particularly on the content itself because that's something that's quite subject specific but there are characteristics of the structure the format and just the way that things are written that takes an essay from maybe you know hovering around the 63% mark to taking it past the 70% mark. So the first thing I want to start off with is the introduction. Now I very rarely see this being done and I think it's actually quite powerful and I tend to see this at thesis sort of PhD level. So if you're an undergrad and you're writing similar to this um, and you're including this in your structure, it's very impressive. So this person has begun with a sort of uh, orientation to their essay. So it's an introduction essentially, but it's not just an introduction that introduces the topic and defines like keywords, but it actually orientates the reader and tells them what's to come in this essay, uh, the structure of the essay and kind of points out the different sections of it. So you can clearly see that the person said, in this essay, I argue that it's very, it's quite a strong and actually you'd, some would say it's quite an abrupt entrance to an essay uh, just because normally you kind of try to slowly go into it but actually I quite like this it gets straight to the point so in this essay I argue that and then it'll give the sort of argument the debate the discussion that's going to be sort of uh, overarching the the whole essay um, so this is a discussion and then it goes on to say in section one of this essay I outline X in section two of this essay I argue that and finally, in section three of this essay, I introduce the concept of. So I know as a reader straight away that there will be three parts to this essay. One will be outlining, the second will be arguing, and the third will be introducing a new concept. This is so powerful. Being able to put the reader in a sort of the right sort of direction for what they're about to read, and also being really confident in what you're saying. To me, when I read this introduction, it says this person knows their stuff, right? They've done their reading, they understand the topic really well, and they've broken it down in a way that's coherent, cohesive, and I expect to see a nice flow when I start reading the essay as well. So I really like this, and I highly recommend that if you're someone that's writing an essay soon, you, in, you kind of include a bit of an orientation uh, to your essay. We see this quite a lot in at PhD level where of course you have you know many chapters, hundreds of pages. So we see sort of a, a, quite a big section where people tend to introduce the main idea, the thesis statement and then sort of in chapter one I'll be speaking about this, in chapter two I'll be speaking about that and I you still don't see it as much but I tend to see it there a bit more but definitely at undergrad if you include this, you're up there. So that's the first thing. Okay, the second aspect of this essay that helps it hit the first class is the use of subheadings to break up the work. So you can clearly see there's one subheading and then there's another one here. I don't know why it's done this weird sign for subheading, but there's another section um, and then there's a conclusion and then it goes on to like another part. But what this is doing is it's breaking up the essay into understandable sections. Now this helps not only you, because when you're writing, you are, you make it a bit clearer for yourself. You know what's to come, you know what you should be including in this section, but it also helps your reader to again, orientate themselves, know what's to expect. 
in this particular section. They know what you're speaking about. They can kind of close off each uh, subsection with the topic heading. One of the key things with a first class essay at university level is it can, I wouldn't say it's publishable, but it, it could be written at a publishable level. And if it's written at a publishable level, that means the structure needs to be absolutely perfect. That means it needs to have subheadings and it needs to be able to flow as well. So I think using subheadings is something that I began to do in my third year of university when I realized actually this is helping me too. It's something that I'm able to take away and use as a tool to help me with what to include for each of my sections and you can actually use this to help you plan out as well your outlines too so that's really cool. Um, so yeah I definitely recommend using subheadings uh, when it comes to breaking up your essay. The third point that I can straight away see with this essay even though this isn't my subject area is that it uses a very clear PEEL structure so point evidence, explanation, link. So give a point. The first point they're saying here in this particular paragraph is stating that um, like what Socrates is saying and giving a bit of an overview as to the topic. Then it's kind of giving some evidence. So in here, the evidence is a bit different to what you might see in the biological sciences. In the sciences, you might have like some data points um, you'd have a reference for a research paper that has looked at something similar, etc. So this is not very similar to how it would be written in the biological sciences. But the evidence here would be the response to the question, some quotes that they've pulled out of different parts of literature possibly. So that's sort of the evidence. Then there's the explanation. In the last third of the paragraph is explaining here what this means, the definition of it, and kind of making it relatable and sort of more understandable um, in that paragraph. And then the last part is linking to the next section. So there'll be a bit of a, um, a sentence here that ends off that actually kind of follows on to the next paragraph. So if you look at these two, it links up. So here's talking about PD and here's also talking about PD. So it all links up and that's what you want to do. So give a point, present some information that is evidence, then explain it. So explain it in context of your essay question, then link it. So this linking means that you're linking it to the next paragraph, you're linking it to the next idea or the next section. So this is a really nice structure that if you follow, you pretty much have written your essay in quite a nice way and it's understandable, you're not missing any parts out and you're hitting all the tick marks in the checkbox. And then the fourth point is the conclusion. Your conclusion needs to be as strong as your introduction. The introduction is the first part of your essay that your reader will be reading and the conclusion is the last part. So that's what they're going to walk away from, from the conclusion. So it needs to be written in quite a nice, concise way that does not introduce any new ideas. That's a key thing. You do not introduce any new ideas, but you do introduce and kind of summarize your, and remind even, uh, your reader of what you were discussing within your essay. So let's take a look at the conclusion here. It says, in conclusion, I have argued that. I love it when students just use clear and easy terminology. I, I find sometimes when students tend to uh, try to be a little bit um, creative with their academic writing, it doesn't always come across and it actually sometimes is a little bit hard to read. I read a piece of work recently where the English was absolutely amazing, but it was just so heavy that I had to kind of pause at l many points just to reread the previous sentence to make sure that I, it made sense. So just use basic English. In conclusion, I have argued that. I know it's a conclusion, I know that you're about to tell me and summarize your thesis or your essay kind of statement and that's honestly the strongest way that you can write it. And then it's kind of, kind of gone on to say, I have given two reasons why this is so. In section two, I said this and in section three, I suggested that. So kind of relating back to the different sections, reminding you where this information has been stated already. So that's again, really powerful as 
it's kind of going back and, and not introducing new ideas, but just pulling out the information that has already been said. And I love, I love that this person has used first person. Another question that I get asked quite a bit is, can I use first person in my essays? Absolutely, yes. At thesis PhD level, definitely I'd actually recommend it. But at undergrad level, I would say use it with caution. You can use it in situations like this where you're kind of adding it as your conclusion uh, or kind of in your introduction where you're stating what you are about to display or stating what you're about to say. You can actually see how powerful it makes the conclusion when you're saying, I have argued that, I showed this, I suggested that. It isn't overdone, there's only one, two, three, I think four eyes in this paragraph. So it hasn't been overdone, but it's neat enough that I understand that the reader is just kind of summarizing what they have looked at. It makes it feel and seem really um, sort of organic and original as well. So I, I really like that. And then at number five, the fifth thing that you want to include in a first class essay is a really good range of sources. I've mentioned a major the majority of things that uh, an examiner would be looking for for a first class essay. But in this particular one, I can't see any referencing. So I'm assuming they were told not to reference and maybe they were only using one text. But generally, you do need to make sure that you have a wide range of sources. So go beyond the reading list. Don't only focus on kind of the names and the search papers that your supervisor has given you. Go beyond that. Look at other related papers that might have cited that paper, that might have been before that paper. So you're showing that you've read around your subject and you've shown an interest in your sub subject. Without doing that, you most definitely can't achieve a first class degree. So do make sure that you're including research papers that are not on the reference list. That was a summary of the five things that you want to include in a first class essay. I'll be leaving the link to this essay in the description down below. So go ahead and click it. If you want me or one of a PhD researcher or my team to take a look at your essay to make sure you're on track, then do send it to thepagedoctor.com and we can take a look at it for you within five hours at the quickest. Um, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give me a huge subscribe uh, and a huge like and leave me a comment and let me know how you found this and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye.